It sounds like keto could be making a comeback. Here's what happens. People start something, they get a lot of interest in it. Like there was a lot of interest in keto seven, eight years ago. So what happens is a lot of scientific research starts because there's interest. And sometimes that's the way science works. Like it's fed by interest a lot of times. Well, what happens is then people, you know, lose interest or whatever. Things happen. People talk about it on social media. There's bad mouthing. There's this, there's that. There's controversy. It happens. But now we're at a state where a lot of those randomized controlled trials and those big studies, all the findings are coming out after the trend isn't as hot anymore, right? So keto could be making a huge comeback because now these new randomized controlled trials are coming out and there's some pretty cool stuff. So I wanna break down the new literature that has come out. And we're not talking little rodent model fruit fly research. We're talking randomized controlled trials that are huge. Let's check it out. The first one is a big umbrella study. It was published in BMC Medicine in May, 2023. Now an umbrella study in this case is like a meta-analysis of meta-analysis. So what this was looking at was 17 different meta-analyses, which looked at multiple studies within each one. And there was a total of 68 randomized controlled trials. Out of these 68 randomized controlled trials, 51 of them showed statistical significance when it came down to positive associations. As far as the keto diet is concerned, what does that mean? It means there were 51 studies that showed statistically significant findings when it came down to good things. Now, when it comes down to statistically significant, let me just give a very basic rundown of what that means. I'm not a biostatistician, but statistically significant doesn't always mean that it's actually significant. Okay, statistically significant is almost arbitrary. Because sometimes it's set by like what they expect a result to be and something that has a strong significant significance sometimes just means that it vastly exceeded certain expectations, right? So a strong or a moderate statistical significance means that the study did kind of better than expected and it's worth noting. Sometimes there's still light statistical significance, still worth noting, but usually not as impactful of a result. Well, there were strong and moderate statistical significant findings when it came down to triglyceride reduction, when it came down to seizures, when it came down to body fat reduction, when it came down to HbA1c, glucose modulation, and when it came down to fat oxidation. Now, fat oxidation may sound like something kind of boring, but when we actually find statistically significant findings with fat oxidation, that is telling us that the body is getting more efficient at utilizing its fuels, which is one of the biggest things that you could want when it comes down to a healthy metabolism, fat loss, and you guessed it, longevity. If we're not constantly oxidizing glucose and we have the ability to oxidize fats, we are oxidizing a fuel that is a much cleaner burning fuel. Now, you're watching me. You might remember that I lost 100 pounds utilizing keto, so I like it a lot, and I may have some biases with it, but I also do a really good job of trying to look at all the different pictures here. I can't help but when I look at this research to think, dang, I think I chose the right one. What the researchers concluded out of this entire umbrella study was that the ketogenic diet is really, really good for overweight people that need to lose weight pretty fast without a decrease in muscle mass. What's kind of crazy is that for so long, people have been telling us that keto was terrible for muscle, like it would help you uh, lose muscle fast. They, they thought that carbs were the only thing that were gonna preserve muscle. I think most of us now know, based on like how loud social media is, is that protein's probably the most important thing. And when a lot of people start a ketogenic diet, Believe it or not, they're eating more protein than they were before because they're replacing so much of the processed garbage and the starches, now they're adding protein in. But now let's move over to another study that's specifically for weight loss. And this is another huge study that looked at 18 randomized controlled trials. This was published in Critical Reviews in Food Science and Nutrition. Okay, and out of 18 randomized controlled trials, all of them showed positive results when it came down to body fat reduction and more importantly, visceral fat reduction. Okay, don't get me wrong. You could probably go on a pretty scarce like vegan diet and as long as you're restricting calories, you'll lose some fat mass, okay? 
So this doesn't really solve a lot of the world's problems, but it does tell us that, okay, no one's gonna deny anymore that keto is good for fat loss. Okay, but how does it compare against anything else? Like, if you restrict calories, aren't you just gonna lose weight? Well, there was another study that's really new that broke this down and it compared keto to Mediterranean specifically. They wanted to find which diet would lead to a 5% reduction in fat the fastest. It was a fat loss race. Bottom line, the ketogenic diet, they lost 5% fat in one month. The Mediterranean diet lost 5% fat in three months. Does that mean the Mediterranean diet sucks? Heck no, I love the Mediterranean diet, right? But what this is showing us is that the ketogenic diet does, for whatever reason, probably in overweight, metabolically unhealthy people, kickstart things a little bit more to get them into that fat oxidative state where they burn fat faster. But here's what's interesting, and here's what balances it out and makes it so it doesn't sound like a one-sided cheeky argument. Long-term, the Mediterranean diet worked better for fat loss and waist size reduction. The ketogenic diet still worked, but it got eclipsed by the Mediterranean. I have some theories as to why this happened, but the bottom line is that if you lose the weight first with keto, you probably can transition into something more sustainable because keto is beautiful and sustainable for a lot of people. Sometimes it's easy for us to believe that our own thoughts are also true for everybody else. I thought the ketogenic diet was perfectly sustainable, but then when I talk to the public, I do find about 80% of people that do it get really bored of it, and maybe their chance of relapsing into another diet is pretty high. So for me, it's sustainable, but for a lot of people, it wasn't and maybe they transition into a Mediterranean, they dabble back and forth, and that would be a better long-term plan. I also think that when it comes down to sustainability with any kind of protocol, you need to have foods that you enjoy. If you don't have foods that you enjoy, I don't know, you're just depleting so much willpower all the time trying to abstain from things, eventually you will fatigue. You will have willpower fatigue. And there's a small subset of people that may not experience that, but most people will. And yes, there are a lot of good like ketogenic treats and things like that out there, and that helps, but sometimes that leads us down not so good path either. You wanna keep it balanced, you wanna keep it close to the earth, you wanna get yourself sort of more addicted to whole foods, right? So you opt for some fruit, you opt for some meat, you opt for things like that, and maybe the occasional nut butter and things like that to give yourself a treat, but you're not like going back to the well for something terrible. I put a link down below for Thrive Market. That's a 30% off discount link for any kind of groceries that you want from Thrive Market. It gets delivered to your doorstep. Now, if you've watched my channel, you know I've talked about Thrive Market before, but I did just recently launch two products that I created myself with Thrive Market. I created like a chocolate hazelnut Nutella alternative so that people could still enjoy that taste, except it's sweetened with allulose and there's no hidden nastiness in it. It's all super clean. So it's allulose, then you've got the nuts, you've got nothing weird, no weird emulsifiers. Okay, then I also have cinnamon Brazil nut butter, but I also created some truffles that are sweetened with allulose as well. So these are perfect whether you're doing keto or not. It's just a way to reduce the sugar and have something that's a little more sustainable and a nice little treat. But even if you don't get those, it's still 30% off your entire grocery cart through Thrive Market. I just thought that was a nice little perk if you wanna try those out. So you can search for those. I also linked out to them if you're an existing member. But you also still get that free $60 gift. So there's a bunch of perks. 30% off, you've got my new products, and you've got a $60 gift when you try out Thrive Market today. So that link down below this video in the top line of the description. Longevity, probably the most hot button type of nutrition content that's out there right now. It's all surrounding that. In the world of keto and longevity, there's some new research that's come out as well. In 2023, there was a study that was published in Exercise and Sports Science, and I'm gonna read you an excerpt from this study. There is growing evidence that the ketogenic diet is able to increase mitochondrial biogenesis and activity within skeletal muscle, resulting in greater muscle function with age. What this means is that as we get older, our muscles don't function as well. And our muscles are one of the strongest sort of quote unquote longevity organs that we have. If we lose muscle, we essentially lose life. And there are a lot of researchers that are talking about this. And Dr. Gabrielle Lyon has made it like her mission to get this out there, right? So when we can actually see literature that we're protecting the skeletal muscle and preserving muscle cells and preserving mitochondria, that is a huge piece when it comes down to aging. Now, how does this potentially happen? Well, for one, ketones themselves increase the expression of PGC1A. What PGC1A does 
is it allows our mitochondria in our cells, in our muscle, to rebuild, go through biogenesis. So as we get older, we get dysfunctional mitochondria that don't produce energy as well within our muscles. And that's one of the reasons why we get weaker and why we lose muscle and why we have metabolic dysfunction. If we can repair those mitochondria and replenish them, we're staving off some of that muscle wasting and we're also preserving muscle function and keeping our strength. This is huge for health quality, health span, and also lifespan itself. When we're doing a ketogenic diet, we also activate AMPK more. What this simply means in human terms is that you are activating more mitophagy. So you're allowing the mitochondria to go through a little bit more of a, what we would call like sort of a recycling process. Now that has a lot of nuance to it, but in essence for aging, the more recycling that our mitochondria can go through, the more efficient our mitochondria will be to a certain extent. So there's a lot of evidence now that is suggesting that for longevity, periodic bouts of a ketogenic diet could be very, very, very good. And now we get into some really exciting territory, an area where we've known keto to be strong, but now the literature is almost undeniable, the world of neuroscience. Now, neuroscience, neurological health, neurodegenerative conditions, all this has been all the rage of the last couple of years since Andrew Huberman came on the scene. So it's time that we resurface some of this talk about keto now that the randomized control trials are really out there. There was a 2023 study in nutrition neuroscience, took a look at 49 studies. 27 of them were human studies. Of those human studies, 80% of them showed a positive correlation with cognitive function, brain performance, and brain health with no negative effects, no downsides. The other 20% didn't show anything negative, they just didn't show positive, right? So 80% of the human studies showed that a ketogenic protocol was improving their brain health and their neurological state. We can get into the particulars, and if you want me to get a little biochemical on you, I will for a second. Ketones in the brain reduce oxidative stress. The brain is running on a cleaner fuel. And if you're already metabolically damaged or overweight, this is hugely beneficial, okay? We also have a decrease in neuroinflammation. We've seen this. I've talked about it specifically with Dr. Dom Diagostino on how it reduces neuroinflammation and allows the brain to actually communicate within itself better. We also create more energy, more ATP per molecule of oxygen. So we get more energy per breath, so to speak. That's huge when it comes down to the brain, which is a huge energy hog. And then finally, we have an increase in BDNF that actually supports the growth of new neurons in our brain. So it might actually help you recover if you've lost brain cells before. It might help you bounce back from maybe a poor lifestyle. And what we've gathered from all this literature now is that keto is safe. Keto works when it comes down to a, a, a literally kind of a quick fix on a lot of things. It may not be the best thing for you to do long-term though, once you've reached your goal weight, because there's reasons to increase calories and increase carbohydrates, especially if you're active. But I do not see any reason why someone couldn't do it for a longer period of time. It just might not be the best for performance. You might feel better after you've done it for five, six years to transition into different ways and then dabble back and forth. But it certainly is making a comeback, at least as far as the randomized controlled trials are concerned. I'll see you tomorrow.